does animal agriculture have anything to do with antibiotic resistant bacteria? Yes, um, a lot. Um, all right, so um, misusing and overusing antibiotics increases the chances that uh, bacteria evolve um, to become resistant to the antibiotics. And we mostly only hear about this problem um, with doctors over prescribing antibiotics. And that is indeed a problem, but it's actually a minority of the, of the problem. And the reason is animals are being given the vast majority of antibiotics. And it's for two reasons. One is that the um, animals are kept in such horrible conditions that uh, the antibiotics are keeping them alive long enough until they're ready to be killed for market. Um, and given how, given, you know, how short some of their lives are, I mean, that's really a statement in itself that you need antibiotics just to keep them alive, alive a few weeks to, um, that's how bad the, the treatment is. And the second uh, reason that antibiotics are given to animals is it turns out that antibiotics make animals grow faster. And so it's a profit motive for farmers to get the animals to, to market weight faster. So um, in any case, because of our antibiotic misuse, we already have over um, a million human deaths a year because of resistant, resistant bacteria. And if we keep on this path, um, it will take us uh, back to a time before antibiotics. And that would mean tens of millions or more of human deaths a year. So while we should work on doctors over prescribing, um, really we have to focus on animal agriculture as well. And, and this, is, this is one of those interesting um, areas that, that points out an interesting fact to me as well. It's like um, a lot of times humans, you know, people will say, well, um, I'm putting humans first and, and um, uh, you know, why care about animals? Because let's, we should care about it, humans first. And, and what's so interesting is that as you run down all of these issues, like, as I just said, there's like a million human beings being killed because of what we're doing to animals a year now, not in the future, not made up, this is now. Um, and, and yet you're saying you're putting humans first? That doesn't make sense to me anymore. Uh, duly noted. Um, <laughs> I have a question coming in now from Leonard. Uh, Leonard, I'm asking you to unmute. There you go. Hi, Leonard. Hi. Um, I was curious what you would say. Um, how would the how would you say with the Bible stands on, on these issues? Sure. So, okay. Um, so the, the, so I've got a short, true answer, and then I'll expand a little bit. So, um, obviously with religion, we're not talking about something that's logical and rational, right? We're, um, we're talking about religion. And so the real answer to the question, and in a sense, as harsh as this may may sound to somebody who's very religious, is that just like we don't allow our religious views on other matters, like let's say gays, um, we don't allow in society the the our uh, uh, view on on rights to override the rights of gay people in society. Um, we shouldn't let it do so for animals either. So so the in a certain sense, um, whether you believe in it or not, as a society, we keep that separate. And, and so it should come, it should have no play whatsoever in terms of animal rights. But I do have a chapter in the book as well, because obviously a lot of people are um, religious. And, and, and so I want to talk about how it still fits in perfectly well. Um, with religious views um, uh, and, and for someone who thinks it doesn't to kind of like jar their thinking on it uh, a little. So, um, so uh, obviously, for example, uh, like 
it's hardly ever the case that a religion uh, demands eating animals, right? So religion isn't stopping you. Um, so if you consider yourself a rational person outside of the religious elements, then you're still back to, you know, what's your rational reason? Um, because the religion didn't stop you. Uh, so, um, you know, so you have to think about it a little further. And then oftentimes also, um, uh, oftentimes, like if we're talking about specifically the, the, the Bible, then you can definitely point to that, um, like uh, in the Garden of Eden, it certainly sounds that people are, that, like it was vegan and also kind of like uh, messianic times that also uh, suggest that maybe, um, you know, the lion lies down with the lamb, that kind of thing. So it certainly leaves it open to interpretation that that's um, uh, um, a desi the most desirable way of being and we're kind of fallen. And so, you know, it's, if you are trying to raise up, then that, that should be a positive thing. Veganism should be a positive thing. And then the, the, the final thing I would say is that also a lot of times religions have um, very strict rules for treatment of animals. And, um, I, you know, like there's no way anyone could argue that our current treatment of animals follows those rules. So, um, so those, those are a number of issues I would say. And, and I'd also point to, point to people, especially if they're um, heavily Christian and conservative, I would point them to a book called uh, Dominion by Matthew Scully. Um, it's very well written, and um, and I think it, it speaks to people in that regard. But but again, go, like there's only so much. As I said from the beginning, our society is meant to keep that separate from rights, and so whatever your religion feels, it should have no play as as far as I'm concerned. Thanks very much for that. And um, let me ask you this. Um, does eating animal products have anything to do with COVID or future viruses and pandemics that you're aware of? Oh, yes. Don't, let, don't get me started on that. <laughs> no, it's actually been a very um, disappointing time um, with COVID because um, like it should have, it should have, uh, it should have told us something. We should have learned from it, and we haven't. And it's very disappointing. So, okay. So, uh, animal products, in a very real sense, uh, causes pandemics. And there's a couple of ways. So, first, um, as demand for animal products go up, um, as I talked about with deforestation, more land is always needed to grow crops, to feed the animals, or for grazing the animals. And so they chop down forests, or they take over other wilderness hab habitats. And this brings novel viruses into contact with humans. So like, that's actually what causes the pandemic. Um, the second way is the wildlife trade similarly brings novel viruses into contact with between animals and humans. So we're bringing these novel viruses that would have been on their own into contact with humans and we don't take precautions and that's that's generally how we start pandemics. And the third way is animal farming itself often puts animals in a situation that encourages virus mutation. So many of the animals are placed together in conditions that are total breeding grounds for pathogens and increases the chances that these pathogens um, will um, mutate and um, and spread and get out to humans. And so those are uh, three different ways that, um, that animal agriculture actually starts pandemics. It's the cause of it. And the analogy I use is needle sharing. So there are no novel viruses out in the wild. So it's never gonna be a case that um, global veganism guarantees us a world with a pandemic risk of zero, but just as needle sharing is an extremely high risk behavior, um, are using animals and, and animal agriculture and the wildlife trade ups the risk of pandemics so much higher 
that we're now living in uh, pandemic scares or full-blown events every few years now, rather than a practically zero event um, if we weren't doing those things. So, so while there's been a lot of debate over whether the origin of COVID-19 was an animal market or a lab leak, um, we do know uh, a couple of things. First of all, we do know that in the 1918 flu, uh, most likely started on a chicken farm in Kansas. And that flu killed 50 million people. And that was before modern factory farming. So the question of the exact cause of COVID-19 to me is irrelevant in terms of how to protect ourselves in the future. Because any rational response um, to the fact that COVID happened and screwed up all of our lives, the entire world brought to its knees um, and so much loss uh, uh, of life and economic activity and everything else um, and so much human misery, uh, any rational response to make sure that never happens again is not to just care about the specific way COVID-19 happened this time, um, but, to but to take care of all the possible ways that um, pandemics start. So even if uh, COVID-19 was a lab leak, um, which we don't know right now uh, which one it was, um, you'd have to cover both uh, more lab protections, but also uh, animal agriculture. So, and to not do that, it would be like saying, well, they were sharing needles from brand X while we're sharing needles from brand Y. So it has nothing to do with us. And that doesn't make any sense. We have to stop all needle sharing period. And, and I think that's what we should have learned and we still haven't learned it. Thanks for that. Um, with regards to animal agriculture, is it causing us losses in our drinking water or just water shortages in general around the world? Yes. And um, the reason for that is the, um, the, same, the same reason that we've talked about uh, already. And that is because just as animals um, eat a lot more uh, than, than uh, you know, than if they're eating the plants first and then we eat the animals, uh, it's also the same with uh, water. So animals have to drink water themselves. And, um, and so we're wasting all the water that way. And then also um, animals are, you, if you have to look at the water footprint of uh, growing all of the, the plants for um, the animals to eat. And so that water footprint is extremely large as well. And if you actually work out the numbers, it's, it's, um, it's like a hundred times or more than growing grains to eat. So we're often told, um, you know, to personally conserve water and, and like that's the messaging we get is, is like all of those personal um, conservation. But if you actually work out the numbers and the percentages, um, the, the, that's the tiny, tiny percent. The most is coming from agriculture and, and mostly from animal agriculture. And, and so, uh, just to put that in perspective, uh, we would save, a person would save more water replacing just one pound of beef with plant foods than they would save by not showering at all for months. There you go. Um, thank you so much. We have a question coming in now from Dominique. Welcome, Dominique. Hi, thank you. So um, I'm hearing this and um, I'm 57. So most of my life is over, but I'm thinking of the new generations, the next generations. And I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit pessimistic. How optimistic are you? And what um, what argument do you think would tip the scale towards eating a vegan diet and living a, a vegan lifestyle? Because it doesn't look like the pandemic is doing it. It doesn't look like these 
uh, weather catastrophes are doing it. I'm pretty sure if it comes to the wallet, it will, but the governments uh, just uh, continue to salvage this horrible industry to the tune of a billion dollars. So I'm, I mean, I'm pretty pessim pessimistic. <laughs> yeah. I, I hear you. Yeah, no, and I, I, in a sense, the pandemic made me a little more pessimistic as well, because if anything should have taught us anything it's it's that it's like you know here we have the whole world being brought to its knees and we still <laughs> and people were you know not learning from it so so I, I hear you on that um for me uh here are the reasons why I would be optimistic um and I'm not sure that the um the okay so I don't know about the time scale um but in terms of the reasons why I'm optimistic is uh, a couple of reasons. One, um, the, the fact that uh, we do consider ourselves a rational society. Uh, people like to consider themselves rational and it really uh, gives them a lot of dissonance if they're shown to be not rational. And, um, and, and now that the, the animal rights argument is just, um, you know, it's it's an, um, proven, basically. Uh, uh, that that that's one reason I'm optimistic. Uh, practically speaking, the 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 bigger reason I'm optimistic is is that um, it feels like they, they are getting closer and closer to. Uh, they've already made so much progress with plant meat, and and they're making more and more progress um, every year. And, and if lab meat shows the same promise, then that I think is um, a game changer because just like if you looked at, for example, um, cars taking over horses, um, yeah, we could have argued for uh, um, about mistreatment of horses and we could argue that, but it probably, would have taken a lot longer to change than the fact that cars came along and replaced it. So in that same way, I'm, I'm optimistic that we are seeing uh, real, uh, a lot of people who are interested in this area and, and um, scientifically putting the resources to make this change. And, and with that in place, I think that gives uh, that means more people will will be on board because in th at that time they're they're just having to admit I'm I'm either a, a luddite who doesn't think uh, anything about technology advances in technology um, or um, I just want to hurt animals right like there's no excuse anymore you, you you've given them a, a replacement that is exactly the product that they're they're getting so. Um, at that point, I think that, that so many more people will come on board that, that the, we don't have to worry about the stragglers because we'll have enough power at that point to um, make changes in the law and they just won't have enough.